George Lewis, a case professor of music at Columbia University, right here. And uh, before we begin, I just wanted to express my great appreciation to Maestro Boulez for being here uh, to speak with us this morning, and also for that extraordinary film, which is, in fact, I found out two films in one, because I saw a completely different film. And on the film that I saw, there was a huge and amazing performance of the poem, which, mm -hmm. which, which at least two of us were at, Miller Puckett and myself, at the 1984 performance uh, at Aircom. Uh, and the topic of our discussion, or one of the topics of our discussion, uh, follows directly from the, the poem section of the film in that we wanted to look, among other things, a bit more closely at the central role played by Maestro Boulez in fostering innovations in music technology, not only as a composer, but also as a sort of an institution builder with his founding in 1975 of the Institute for Research and Coordination, uh, Acoustic Music, or simply IRCOM. Now, you, some of you may know that, for example, canonical new media histories tend to date the advent of interactivity and art making to the mid-1980s. But if you remember the period when multimedia didn't refer to computers, you may find that a bit ironic. There's a bit of historical rupture separating the notion of interactivity that we know today from the practices that arose in the computer music communities beginning at this time, the early 1970s. And Ripoll and other pieces by Maestro Boulez are signal examples of this pioneering activity in new media interactivity. Um, a, a, for example, Repolt, and I think in the, in the minds of many of us, is a major work to emerge from that early period. And it's something of a tribute to the integration of technology into our everyday lives that the brief segment from the piece didn't say anything about the way the technology was developed. And there's a lot more to say about that. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to, for the sake of the people listening later on WKCR, to introduce the members of the panel. Um, uh, first professor uh, to my right, Professor Miller Puckett, who won Putnam and NSF fellowships to study mathematics at MIT and Harvard. He finished his PhD in 1986. At the same time, around the same time, from 79 to 86, Professor Puckett worked on real-time techniques for live music performance at the MIT Media Lab. And then he joined IRCOM, where he wrote the very important computer program, Max, the highly influential environment used by computer musicians the world over, and which is, as you might have seen on a part of the screen, you saw those uh, little screen segments. Those are basically Max things, right? Uh, those are Max screens, yes. Um, in 1994, Professor Puckett joined the faculty at the University of California, San Diego, where I was at the time as well, uh, where he is now professor and chair of the Department of Music and is developing a new software environment for computer music called Pure Data. Um, then we have Martin Scherzinger to my left, uh, associate professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University, specializing in sound studies, musical culture, media, and politics of the 20th and 21st centuries with particular interests in non-Western music, the political hermeneutics of absolute music, cultures of musicology, philosophy, and music theory, all in relation to political economy in an international frame. Professor Scherzinger recently presented the paper, Boulez, Prophet, or How Deleuze Misunderstands Music, at the annual meeting of the American Musicological Society in November of 2010. Um, then we have uh, the person who's made this all possible in many respects from the standpoint of working with the Department of Music, and we'd like to also thank uh, Shani Peer, or you call, him Sh you call her Shani, right, Shani? Yes, Shani Peer, who's the director of the, the, the Maison Francaise. Um, uh, Fabien is assistant professor of composition at uh, Columbia University. Professor Levy studied composition with Gerard Grise, music analogist with Michael Leminas, ethnomusicology with Gilles Latour, and orchestration with Marc Andre Dalbavi. He holds a PhD in musicology from the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales, a master's degree in mathematical economics as well. His compositions have been performed across Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, and he's received numerous prizes. Uh, Professor Levy was at IRCOM from 1998 to 2001, first as director of the project Studio Online, then as pedagogical advisor, and he has also published two edited volumes under IRCOM's mark. Now, for my part, uh, I'm not going to go through a long preamble except to say that I was at IRCOM for three years, between 1982 and 1984, 85, and in 84, I presented a, a work for network interactive uh, computers in their well-known salle de projection. 
So um, that was around the time that I heard the Paris version of Rapon. Now, you know, you were quoted as saying, Maestro, that um, I think at one point you said something like, and this is the English translation, we try to foresee certain directions that the music could take and give them a chance to manifest themselves. Now, certainly we can see that in the frame of composition, but it seems that the foundation of IRCOM had a great deal to do with assembling a cultural consensus that went beyond uh, music making. I mean, could you speak about the origins of that? Well, so the origin was, uh, as you are generally, you are not satisfied with the present situation. <laughs> And then when you are not satisfied with the present situation, you try to find a solution. And that was the case. Uh, generally, what, what was called electronic music was in the hands of amateurs and uh, real people who did not work seriously. And therefore, the results were very disappointing most of the time. It was poetic uh, with all the inconvenience and, uh, and convenience, but especially inconvenience of poetry, seems like that. And uh, I think as I mean, a, a very serious work has to be done on the material of music and the, and the thinking of music. You know, I was always in admiration in front of the architects, because the, the architecture began to, began to, to change, and uh, not only the realization, but the conception of architecture when people were busy with the material of the architecture, and then with steel, glass, and so on, all these materials, you can do something totally unexpected. It began with Miss Van der Rohe, and now, you know, it, it, it has still an evolution, and between Miss Van der Rohe and Frank Gehry, you see all the evolution of the material itself. And I think music should have also the same uh, reflection on the material of music. Uh, how is the what is the sound exactly? How one can use the sound, and uh, how you can develop different categories of music: category of time, category of perception, and so on and so forth. And invent music with not only it is forbidden to do that, although you, you should do in this time evolution not do that anymore, but do things positively with the new material which obliged you to think differently. And that was the, concept, the beginning of your company. But how did it work in terms of the cultural consensus, the political consensus? For example, we've all read in various, in various histories that you met personally with uh, the president of the Republic, Georges Pompidou, at the time to um, get things moving. Well, as you know, as I mean, uh, I was out of France for very long because I disagreed totally with the politics uh, of in music. So I don't want to, uh, to uh, that's a, you know, a kind of uh, war which is uh, past and I don't want to think about it even. <laughs> but uh, uh, then I mean, the president, uh, you know, I was in, in a country house in, in France uh, in 70, 69. And suddenly uh, came a call of the president of the republic. And I thought it was a joke. And I said, please, could you come back? Because I am not sure of my agenda. <laughs> and uh, finally, <laughs> there was a second call. Uh, the president would like to have dinner with you. Well, I was uh, very surprised. And uh, Pompidou explained to me uh, the, the center he wanted to have for the arts, generally. And he said, there is no section for music. I would like you to be involved in the music uh, department of the, of the uh, Centre, uh, the future center for the art. And so I said, yes, but uh, you know, it should not be simply a kind of uh, last minute thinking. It should be a very important part. And then he said, well, give me your ideas, and I will, I will uh, think about it. And so I thought at this time of Yakam, I wrote, I don't remember now, four or five pages, uh, and he read them certainly later. And uh, I was included then in the development of Saint Pompidou as part of the department. 
There was a department for painting, as you know. There was a painting uh, department for design. There was a department for literature, a library, a big library. Mm -hmm. And there was a department for music. And the department for music was uh, formed exactly like the other departments. The same importance was given to that. And as a matter of fact, because uh, Pompidou wanted to provoke the creation of new uh, things, generally. And uh, the museum had the tendency to be a museum to, with, with gallery exhibition, let's say, uh, you see, but it was not the center of the creation. And IRCAM was the center of the creation, of a certain direction of the creation, of course. And that was, uh, it was really to fulfill literally the concept uh, thought by Bidou about this center. Um, but I was amazed that, uh, 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 you know, a president was uh, thinking of that as I was uh, out in the world. Well, while you were here in the U.S., um, were you already thinking about this sort of combination of the scientific, technological, and the creative compositional at that time? Were you... Because you'd already been doing these kinds of projects, uh, as you said, and you were involved with people like Stockhouse, and there was the whole history there. There was the history of the Domaine Musicale. There was the GRM. Um, but it seems to me that at a certain point there were, were there any prior models for IRCOM that you could? No, there was no prior model because, the, you know, if I take a comparison, the, the, uh, these institutes for contemporary music was even, yeah, always for big institutions like a dancer. And uh, if there were budget restrictions, the dancer was the first one to suffer. <laughs> and uh, uh, therefore, so I mean, for instance, when the radios in Germany were much less rich and uh, had less money, then the, the electronic <coughs> music studio was the first one to suffer also, to, reduce, to be reduced in its budget. In, its budget. Uh, in all uh, institutions, you know, the electronic music was considered as something expensive, which was not spectacular. And then, therefore, you know, if you have problems, you, you put the problems on uh, the music uh, mm. first. And therefore, I mean, there was no solid institution. They were always depending on something. Because uh, it goes to this point where, you know, I had little <coughs> experience of administration, in the administration, but I mean, the important in come for this foundation, that the budget was depending upon the Centre Pompidou, not about the Ministry of Culture only, not uh, uh, the Department of Music in the Ministry of Culture, but was depending from the Centre. And then, as I mean, it was a source of security uh, for, the, for the budget, and the institution was really very important and considered as important from the very beginning. Well, we have sort of three generations of people who have been associated with IRCOM actually on the panel, and I'd like to open it up to, for other people to ask questions that, I mean, this is a golden opportunity, so. Mm. Shall, I, shall I start in? Um, I, let me tell you, it feels very odd uh, sitting here. I, I joined at IRCOM at the age of 26, and of course the name Pierre Boulez would make people tremble in their boots, uh, not because <laughs> as the movie made clear, not because Boulez would go around chewing people out, but because the quality of the example that he set was such that no one really felt like they could measure up to what they, were, what they had right in front of them. Um, and another observation I'd like to make is that um, in the movie, again, I heard it presented that, well, basically there was no choice. There was no choice but to learn how to conduct because uh, that otherwise the music wouldn't be conducted. There was no choice but to make ear comp because there was no ear comp. And of course there was a choice. You could, uh, Stockhausen didn't do these things. Um, Pierre got his hands dirty and uh, got involved in every aspect of, of making the music of his time, not just composing, but, uh, but playing, conducting, organizing, um, seeing to it that the computer could actually be, be realized as a musical instrument. And I think this is closely related to the fact that Pierre's music is just, uh, at a level of beauty that, that exceeds that of most of his contemporaries. The fact that his, his mind and his hands were in the music 
gave, gives the music itself a kind of richness and, and just plain sensuousness that, that, uh, that you don't get much of in the second half of the 20th century. So um, I'd like to throw that out there as a comment and maybe a compliment. I hope it's a compliment. Um, and an observation that I'd love for you to comment on is this. Um, one thing that I've seen, um, one thing that I think I learned from my days at IRCOM, um, which were very young days for me, um, was the importance of um, was the importance of the of music as a performed medium, not as a as a studio medium. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you see a performance of Raypon, um, you you see the music being made in front of you, even though the music is electronic. And that's that's technically a very hard thing to accomplish. And um, most electronic music of that era, and and even more even to a greater extent, most of the electronic music that we hear today is made in studios um, uh, using a computer but uh, far away from a stage, far away from an audience. And, um, and in Boulez's own writings one sees, uh, oh, that's, that's recording technology. Uh, recording uh, has been, you know, the art of recording has been elevated as a, as a sort of form of music making. And yet, the, uh, the, thing, that, um, the thing that excited I think Pierre and certainly excited me was the notion of electronic music as a thing that you made in front of people uh, at, at the same time as people heard it. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if, I, if I got that distinction right and do you, uh, di did you see this as an imperative that, that, or did you see it as an imperative to protect the role of, of live performance in the making of electronic music and to, um, and to make that be a viable way of making music as opposed to the uh, studio-centered approaches that the radio studios were undertaking at the same time that IRCOM started? Well, I think you are right. As well. That was, I remember, there were discussions at the beginning, very uh, vivid discussions, as I mean, about the, the, the goal of IRCOM. Because there are people who were, you know, c wanted to create a, w a world for itself, but in the studio. And uh, I say, no, we must have, a, you know, I suffered myself as a performer sometimes because I was following uh, what composers were doing. And I remember also, I mean, uh, once there was, uh, when I was at the head of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, we had a uh, concert with uh, live music, uh, not live music, but uh, music which was to be performed in parallel with the tape. Mm. And I remember in one of these work, I had maybe more than thousand cues. <coughs> And, uh, uh, you know, I had, uh, I had uh, uh, cues, uh, 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 visible cues, and I was conducting a score and looking if I am, uh, if I, I was ahead of Q103 or uh, behind Q104. So, I mean, that you are totally paralyzed because you are trying to be in phase and so exactly synchronized with the tape or, uh, you know, you don't exist. You are always, you know, trying to, to cope with either you are too late or you are ahead, and uh, there is no gesture anymore. And uh, uh, what you can do, so, I mean, I am not against, for instance, if you have an installation, uh, and you have a kind of interactive inter installation with, for instance, uh, uh, you know, an installation which is modified by somebody which cuts, the, mm. uh, for instance, the, the, the contact between the loudspeaker and, the, and change the, the, the harmony. And the, you can have the interaction. I am not against it. But if you want to have a world, there, there must be some say, something which is life. And uh, uh, with, with the tape, it was totally opposed, opposed to life. Mm. But on the contrary, that was a kind of music in a can. There is, a, there is no way uh, to, to call it. And therefore, also, I mean, Finally, I remember I had, uh, I had to, to fight for that, to have, to have live electronics. And, uh, and you were one of those who uh, were, was most active in this field. And I remember when you worked, uh, especially with uh, Manuri as a composer, mm -hmm. as a team, that also a problem, uh, uh, one of the problems you have in, in, uh, in an institution like that, that you have people working together because the musician has ideas, for instance, but he does not know how to realize them, and the scientific uh, uh, realize them, uh, uh, you know, where, where after uh, reflection. 
and also that the contrary, the scientific has some ideas, but he does not know how to translate them in kind of using the terms. And then the, the musician can take these ideas and transform them as musical ideas. And uh, at the beginning, they were not music purely musical ideas; they were uh, mainly scientific ideas. And uh, they, they, you, you have to have a junction between the two, and that's very difficult to to, to obtain. But uh, you know, I remember I asked because I was in college de France in Nice. Do you have in in the laboratories? You, did you do, do, do you have the same difficulty between people who are more practitioners and who are theoreticians? And they told me that's exactly the same. Everybody has a tendency after a while to work in this corner <laughs> and to ignore each other. And then you have constantly to to, to bring them together again. And I think that's, I mean, that's the main function of this uh, institute like the account, to bring, not to force them, because that's not good, but to bring them uh, gently but firmly to, to work together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly feel like a beneficiary of that. Yes, you, you were very important at one, at one, at one point, uh, a very capital point in the development of the account. You, you, you know it, yes. I mean, you, you, you were playing a very capital well, thank you. <laughs> yes, first uh, I want to say how for a young composer uh, Master Boulez is important. Uh, I think people don't realize that in the history of music there was, I think, nobody who was so complete and so a model in different ways for a young composer. First, when you study composition, you read a lot of text by Mr. Boulez, uh, theoretical text uh, on Stravinsky, Schoenberg. Uh, you learn uh, his new language technique. Uh, all my students today have assignments with chord multiplications. And uh, uh, he's, of course, a model in terms of musicianship. He's, I think, one of the best conductors in the world. And his interpretation of Stravinsky, Debussy are, are great, uh, incredible. Um, he's, of course, one of his an incredible composer with uh, beautiful music and uh, something which is very rare in music. He, Maestro Boulez organized, is an organizer. He created a lot of uh, institutions, Ensemble de Irkam, who still uh, survive, who still bring a lot of things to the music. So when you are an, a young composer, you, you live with the inner heritage of uh, Maestro Boulez. Uh, it's also very interesting to see that even if people don't know the name of Ligeti, Berio, etc., they know the name of Maestro Boulez. Maestro Boulez is the contemporary music, is the one who invented a reflection, a music, and um, a lot of aspects of music. So my questions will be that. First, I want to add two other aspects which were very important for me as a young composer. First time, this is the sense you had for the detail. You are a demanding person, but this humility which comes with that. I was always uh, very appealed by this sort of humble man that you are behind the music. And I, I try to, to teach that to my students, the sense of the details, the sense of the musicianship you have to have, music first. The second thing which was also a model for me was, uh, you mentioned that in the film, this refusal of the provinciality that uh, there is no French music or American music, like people said, but you have to travel, you have to be yourself, and you have always to uh, go further. So my question would be this one. You are 33 years old, younger than Stravinsky, and however, people realize how different something happens with you, uh, with Stravinsky. I have the chance to be exactly 43 years younger than you. <laughs> However, I see today that many young composers still say we do contemporary music, we use technologies which are a little bit different, but we use Max MSP real time, we use uh, concrete music, we have some techniques which are quite different, uh, people use more noise, new techniques, etc. But the music remains uh, cont contemporary music. And also for the audience, people think, okay, this is a contemporary music that Maestro Boulez created in the 60s. How do you see this evolution today in 2010, the audience today and the young, uh, the, the young composers, how do you see this evolution of music? Because you made this big revolution, 
do you think it, it will continue? Or? Well, the evolution of music uh, now depends another, uh, from another generation. But, I mean, you know, that's in their hands. And uh, I cannot, uh, I don't want to make predictions because generally predictions are destroyed very rapidly. And, uh, 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 <laughs> so, and after that you say, ah, oh, my prediction was wrong. If you, do, if you do no prediction, then you are never wrong. So far, for sure. uh, well, which I, you know, I tried to go to a more general position. I tried the, the institution I created were not for me personally, because I was always very independent. Uh, I, my life, uh, as you uh, know, as I mean, was in different countries at different moments. And I was always independent from the institution. I, cou I could go from one to another one when uh, I, had, I wanted to change. And therefore, so I mean, uh, it taught me one thing. If you are centering, centering an, uh, an institution about your person, even this person being brilliant, I have all the examples at my tongue, but I will not tell them. <laughs> uh, then, as I mean, this institution, if the man disappears, this institution disappears. If I have created these institutions, I don't want that when I disappear myself, they disappear also. I want them to remain as an agent. They can transform themselves. They can be in a different, uh, on a different level. They can be in a different direction. They can uh, uh, be more complex. All what they want but they will not depend on if I am there, if I am not there. And that's essential. If you uh, are too precise in your importance, uh, if your influence, then if your influence disappear, then you, uh, the institution disappear. And that was for me always a very uh, important rule uh, that I observed. And therefore, you know, in IRCAM, after the years of, uh, I established IRCAM, I, I waited, I was very active, even in the administration where, where I really, you know, uh, we, we sometimes I attended because you, had, you, you were obliged to do that as, a, as a, the, the head of the department of Saint Pompidou. Sometimes you had sessions about if the uh, workers who clean the house will uh, make, uh, will go on strike or not. Can you imagine myself in this position, listening two hours on the strike of the people who cleaned the house? That was not terribly exciting. But I mean, I was there as a, you know, as kind of obligation. And so the house was solidly uh, implanted in the, in the bigger house. So uh, when I asked for uh, enlargement of the account because there were not enough studios, you know, I could speak because I knew the people of the administration. And uh, immediately when the administration was solid and the, and the IRCAM was solidly established, like the Assemblée uh, d'Arcadre was solidly established, then I say, now that your turn. I observe, I can my, give my opinion, but I don't want to interfere anymore. And therefore, this and these institutions are totally independent of me. Uh, I, I can give some concept with, with either one or the other one, but I'm not interfering. And I find that uh, the people in charge should have their own opinion, their own method, and their own way. Therefore, so, I, mean, I think the solidity of an institution depends upon the quality <coughs> of the absence after a while. <coughs> well, talking about uh, never being uh, wrong or precise enough to be wrong, uh, my reflection here is going to be um, on uh, Boulez's uh, impact and influence on um, intellectual non-musical uh, milieus. Um, uh, sometimes in the uh, history of philosophy, for example, in the case of Schopenhauer, a figure like Beethoven looms very large, or for Kierkegaard, someone like Mozart, or perhaps we can argue for um, Nietzsche Wagner. 
Um, uh, this is a, a kind of legacy that has befallen Boulez um, as well, equally, and we can pick out more than just one philosopher, uh, perhaps uh, most uh, importantly um, Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, and I pick him out because of his relevance to many um, disciplines today, such as anthropology, media studies, musicology, this sort of resurgence of Deleuze's relevance today. And what I want to just reflect on or acknowledge um, uh, today is the impact and the, uh, the extent to which uh, Boulez's um, thinking on uh, musical matters and uh, also his compositional technique have taken up residency in these different philosophical milieus. And what is fascinating is that um, this has been an ongoing and ever-changing kind of saga. We can begin, for example, um, almost anywhere in his career, um, his ethnological reflections, associations with An André Schiefner and others, uh, the mathematical dimension, uh, the use that Adorno would find for a philosophy of dialectics, um, and then perhaps more pertinently for us today, the um, involvement in structuralism and, uh, and then even more recently in post-structuralism. Um, structuralism, we can point to various sort of crucial debates, we might say, some of them quite polemical. Uh, when Levi-Strauss in um, uh, The Raw and the Cooked picks up on a serial technique and argues against it, finds certain contradictions in it, certain non-language-like aspects, uh, Nicolas Rouvet will do the same uh, with uh, a serial technique. And then this is answered in turn by others like Henri Pousseur and um, uh, more, uh, more uh, in a more developed way by Umberto Eco, who will argue that it is precisely serial technique that opens up the possibility of understanding um, a first articulatory structure as being much more flexible than it might have been hitherto understood. That language itself has a kind of articulatory structure that is more flexible than was understood by Lévi-Strauss um, and Nicolas Rouvet. Once again, Lévi-Strauss turning to Boulez's uh, technique in a way to re-articulate what language in general might, uh, might mean. Um, more recently, the involvement with Foucault, which is to some extent a little bit hyperbolic because it was published um, in English in this country, but also Lyotard um, uh, and uh, particularly Deleuze. There were m encounters that happened 1978 at IRCAM, which was a, a very um, well-attended event in which um, uh, Boulez, uh, Deleuze, uh, Foucault, and uh, Roland Barthes uh, find themselves in the same room discussing uh, various topics, and Deleuze, perhaps the most enthusiastic, um, writes a, a, a paper about making audible forces, or making inaudible forces audible, and so on. And then he writes an essay, uh, a, again, along a similar uh, a topic about time, uh, uh, Boulez, Proust, and time, in which he talks about non-pulsed and pulsed time, and so on, and uses, um, uh, in particular, uh, Boulez's concept of the smooth and the striated, which comes out of uh, Penser, uh, uh, la musique aujourd'hui, uh, to develop a theory, a, a philosophical kind of um, uh, way of thinking identity outside of, or thinking individuation without identity. These kinds of concepts are difficult to talk about in the context of this sort of event, but essentially moving away from understandings of identity and variation into repetition and difference, um, and so on and so forth. So. Reflecting on this, and of course we don't expect any kind of definitive answer, but there's um, also the sense in which um, uh, there's, uh, that uh, these kinds of developments are reflected in some of your lexicon um, over the years. So we, we, we think perhaps of the, um, the essay on taste uh, that was published in Tokyo in 1963, or um, uh, the intermittent appearance of words like the virtual, or difference in your more recent work. So for example, the essay we mentioned now about material, about understanding the material in order to facilitate a, an idea. Um, you use in that essay an example from orchestration that this understanding of the technical and social and historical and acoustic and so on, scientific dimensions of orchestration should not be out of the reach of any composer. Not that you need to literally know all of this, but that it should not be out of the reach of any composer. Uh, and in that sense, you use the word virtual um, to describe that. It doesn't seem structurally that important for that essay, but there is this s subtle inflection of perhaps, in that case, a Deleuzean concept back into, ricocheting back from Deleuze into your writing. So I was wondering if you could reflect for us, um, and again, no definitive answers required, but um, on some of these relationships. 
I am an amateur as, as a philosopher. <laughs> I'm not really uh, able to, to, especially also in the, the language, which is not my language, <laughs> uh, my uh, mother language, as one says. Uh, therefore, that's difficult for me to, to give an answer. But I, I can also say that I was amazed myself by some correspondence, especially with the I must say. Uh, what he took uh, from very simple things I've said how he transformed them to really very, very long-range concepts and uh, interesting. And that's true that uh, the dans uh, how do you call that? dans time and the dimension. The one you, you uh, Oh, the, the essay that he wrote, occupi yeah. Occupying. It's concept of time, striated yeah. time, striated yeah. and yes. smooth. Yes. How do you call that in English? Striated, striated and smooth. And smooth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know what he did about that because I saw that about freedom simply that, uh, that for me that was a very practical uh, thing although it has consequences I, exp I will explain how it came to me and uh, then uh, you know you see that he has transformed it completely uh, myself also when I was writing a piece uh, in Kla, for small group of instruments and resonant instruments. And uh, I like the resonant instruments, but I say, what can I do with these instruments? I like the sonority, and I will base the, uh, the, the, the structure of the piece on this kind of sonority. But how to make a difference? The, the, what is the difference between the other sounds and this sound of a resonant instrument? That, you don't influence them, they die, simply that, and they die more or less rapidly. The vibraphone die in uh, five, four seconds. Uh, the, the, the low register of a piano dies in 25 seconds, and the, 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 the mandolin or the guitar dies in two seconds and so on. So you don't touch it, but you know. And then as I mean, you don't write a score with rhythm. You, you write a score with just the, the dynamic and the register of the instrument. And then you wait until you are enough and you go further. And that's what I call the temps uh, lisse, smooth. Uh, because that has a consequence. As you don't uh, give the estimation of the time, that's like you, you would have you know, something uh, 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 metal, uh, kind of, of a piece of metal and you cannot estimate the, 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 the weight. So you are there and then uh, you, you have this, this time which is absolutely not measurable. And then on the contrary, if I want to measure the time, then I have to measure it with a unit. An even unit an, uh, or even units, that's not a problem. You know, the Stravinsky measure of the time as well as Beethoven measure of the time. That's not, a, not, not the problem of style of difference. Only there is a measurement of the time, and then that's what I mean. The, the perception is totally different. And for instance, uh, you know, if you have uh, 50, uh, 50, sec 50 beats, let's say, and 51 beats, you cannot make any difference. If you have 50 beats and 100 beats, you make a difference. You cannot make a difference. But the difference is because you have, you can measure the time, and all the piece is established about measured time and non-measured time, and that gave me. And it took that, you know, the kind of the difference between measure and non-measure. He took that and de developed that much beyond what I have thought first. So I mean, because. Myself being not a philosopher, I think always in practical terms. Uh, and uh, that is one example. But I mean, uh, I have m many other examples like that, for, like superimposed time, for instance. Uh, I have a work in a ritual when you have uh, different groups and they have the same time unit. But this time unit have uh, uh, interrupted by things which are very, very uh, quick, and that's different in each group. 
So they have the same time unit, but they never coincide. And I would write that, that, was, that would be absolutely impossible. Uh, because you have to, uh, to have interferences between uh, a kind of uh, regular and irregular. And then as I mean, these categories also be belong to, to the, the same big category of time measurable and time not measurable. And so that's my point of view, you know, I, I think of, of uh, categories like that. And uh, I let the philo philosophers speak their own language. I benefit from it, but I would, I would be unable to find it myself. I recognize, you know. And then I uh, received from Le Deleuze or from Foucault, from Foucault uh, lessons, uh, but I am not a good pupil. I am not <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that before we conclude, because we are on the clock, we have time for a few questions. And I hope we have a, a way of giving people microphones. Do we have such a thing? Is there anything like that here? Or can, is there? Is, there is. OK. Um, so that I guess we will uh, please feel free to um, be rec raise your hand and be recognized. And uh, yes, please, you're the first. Um, uh <laughs> Hello. Hi. You're on. Um, my question is for Mr. Boulez. Um uh, some of your writings and statements earlier uh, that I've read seem to propose a antagonistic um, relationship with the past, these certain statements about uh, defacing the Mona Lisa, for instance, and sort of um, trying to capture a revolutionary, constant revolutionary spirit in which, or I mean, Adorno talks about this as being the, the search for the new and sort of maintaining this uh, constant reinvention, and I was wondering if throughout uh, your career, as you've been able to witness uh, many changes in the 20th and 21st century, um, whether you see that the old order has been replaced with something new, and if so, how do you, there's a sort of paradox or contradiction between the idea of maintaining a revolutionary spirit in which um, in which there's a constant need for reinvention, while at the same time establishing institutions which, which you have, um, which require a certain level of stability. Um, I wonder how you sort of saw this contradiction playing out between um, sort of replacing old orders with new orders, and then what if the new orders become uh, too stable, and then there's a stagnance within that? Well, I know that's the world institution. Uh, does not think very uh, revolutionary. On the contrary, as I many saying, institutions are uh, where people, you know, are closed and uh, don't don't uh, are not aware anymore of what uh, the life is outside. And uh, I am not uh, of this uh, institutions. There must be, uh, you know, a threshold. If you have two people who work together, that's not an institution. Certainly not. But that, that cannot be a focus. It, it is simply two people working together or working close together. On the contrary, if you have 50 people or 60 people who work in the same, not the same direction, but in the same institution, when you have discussion, I don't say that an institution is necessarily an institution with, which goes for, for uh, you know, all the year <coughs> and so on. No. An institution, for instance, that's the Academy of, of Lucerne for three weeks a, a, a year. It was Darmstadt, ten, 10 days only. That's an institution. And th 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 there are many forms of institutions. And there are, some, I mean, some, sometimes some institutions have to be constant, and some institutions have to be just uh, for a certain amount of time. And the difficulties with institution that's to uh, survive its own reputation. Uh, because after a while, you know, there is a tendency to, to, to be uh, very happy with, uh, with oneself 
and say we have uh, we are the the best institution. No, you da you have to put always that under scrutiny and uh, sometimes say no 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 it cannot go this way. Uh, you have to be more active. You you have to think more. You have to renew. Give me your ideas. Uh, we will look at that. So, I mean, the, the institution is valid, in my opinion, only if it puts itself under scrutiny every day. And, uh, you know, that's like the phoenix. It has to be burned every day to be reborn. Uh, otherwise, you know, after a while, it becomes a kind of routine institution, and that's the worst <laughs> kind of, of thing. And we don't replace we don't want to replace routine institutions by routine institutions again. So for me, that you know, I am very careful, and I was uh, Mila can tell it. So I mean, uh, you know, when I was at the head of of, of Yaka, I was always inspecting and looking uh, to to see what happens. Simply that, and if nothing happens, well, you see, nothing happens. Please just think more. And, uh, <laughs> so. Thank you. Stuff happened. Yeah. <laughs> Um, my question's actually really similar, um, <laughs> but uh, maybe slightly broader. First of all, I, I really respect your music and all the work you've done for new music in general. Um, I think in this day and age and this social, cultural climate, at least for me, it's very difficult to believe in um, any sort of teleological um, progress of, of music, um, especially of Western music. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems more it seems to me that we're, we're kind of doomed to, to continue to, or blessed to continue to repeat, um, repeat you know, music over and over again. Um, I was just wondering if your concept of musical history has, has changed throughout the years, and um, you know, what, if, if your thought has evolved um, in, in that regard at all. Sorry, that wasn't very clear. <laughs> I don't care for this history of music, I must tell you. Uh, <laughs> because I care always for the present. The history of music will be told by people who live maybe 50 years, 100 years later. And that I cannot predict how they will look at, at that. You know, uh, I, I, I look at my, my own vision uh, between 45 and now. In 45, I discovered uh, uh, composers who were not, we not at all performed at this time, especially in France. We were discovering the, the uh, Schoenberg School. We were discovering Bartok, we were discovering Vares, we were discovering uh, Stravinsky, even Stravinsky was not very often performed at this time. Good. I have the, the impression that we discovered the revolution of 1914 practically, because all the works which are really very revolutionary are of 19, between 1910 and 1920, let's say. Yeah. So we discovered the revolution, and we discovered the establishment of, of the revolution. But now, for instance, when I look at this past, I say, well, that history, and I could not say in 45 it was part of history. I did not know what was really important. I hesitate between the Schoenberg Opus 31 and the Schoenberg Opus 16, if you will f follow what I want to say. Opus 16 was really discovery. Uh, Opus 31 is establishment. But I see it now, and I could not see it in 1945, certainly not. And therefore, as I mean, you know, uh, even uh, Ligeti, for instance, I play, you know, there are discussions now was he revolutionary at the, be at the beginning and conservative in the second half of his life? No, I, I, can, I can imagine that the first, that you know, there was a danger in the first part of his life to be a mannerist. This danger he, f he felt, and then he transformed, he looked at the models of the classics, and therefore the trio uh, uh, with all the first work in this direction. And it was very highly criticized at this period. Now that we are not, we have distance, we, I say, well, he avoided with this kind of, uh, of uh, thinking of, uh, again, to the classicists, he avoided uh, mannerism. 
and the, it was very important. But in 30 years ago, I could not think this way. And therefore, our thinking of history depends on what we are at the moment when we judge the history. And there is no way, uh, no other way for somebody creative, especially, to look at history. That's to destroy this concept, which is fixed of history. And there are things I have never changed. I, I uh, admire very much the Stravinsky of the uh, years 1910-1925. But I must say that Oedipus Rex is for me the, you know, a work which is totally absurd in a way. As I mean, uh, but that's my opinion. And I don't try to, to impose that. And so maybe somebody in 30 years will find that Oedipus Rex was a, a kind of beginning of, uh, of reconceiving the history in a, in a different light. So all judgments are just provisory. And they are provisory even with yourself. We have time for a half of a last question. What, excuse me? I have a long question. You have a long question. Um, let's, if you wouldn't mind uh, deferring to this long question, even though you have the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Maestro Boulez, I had a discussion recently with somebody from IRCAM, and he said he doesn't like the concept of work in progress. And then I asked him, how do you think about the uh, idea of Pierre Boulez, of oeuvre fragment, and oeuvre essay, and oeuvre in variations. And I quoted him <clears throat> the uh, uh, phrase of Adorno on Gustav Mahler, that Mahler's symphony are variations of a lost original. So is there a difference between oeuvre in progress, which he didn't like, and your concept, and uh, unfortunately I didn't see your show at the Louvre, uh, of uh, oeuvre fragment and oeuvre essay. Well, I mean, uh, that depends upon how you consider the work. If you consider the work, uh, you know, the, for, for a long period, uh, the work he had for us, so in our culture, was a beginning to the end and nothing uh, which was without determination. Uh, I think, I think, uh, you know, the, the vocabulary was oriented in this direction. Everything was centered, and what you were, as I mean, you, you had uh, two halves, generally, the sonata movement for a form, for instance, uh, had two halves very precisely uh, established on the degrees of the scale. And uh, uh, you had also a form ABA, which was uh, very beloved by romanticists, especially the German romanticists, and so on and so forth. So I mean, you had frames of action. Now, you don't have any frame of action when you begin a work. You, know, you cannot say, I will write a sonata form movement. Uh, you know, that for me, it is absurd to begin like that. You begin with just elements. And these elements bring you somewhere where you don't expect to be, even. And I, I have a, not a theory that's too, too big a name, but uh, too big a word. But uh, I have a, a feeling always that if I investigate the elements I have uh, in front of me, I will go uh, somewhere where I did not. Uh, well, I was not sure to go. And uh, therefore, I mean, in this work, if I look at that, that's a kind of uh, continuity of segments. And uh, therefore, I mean, the work is it can be never finished. It's finished, but it's finished temporarily. And I can imagine some, some of my works which are finished theoretically, but I can maybe 10 years later, and I say, well, I did not think of that. I will uh, suppose that I will change. Uh, and I find that absolutely uh, legitimate, that a work is not for me finished, never. Even the work which are, I consider to finished, uh, especially. And last year in the Louvre, when you uh, 
uh, we are speaking about that. I propose an exhibit, a small ex exposition, where uh, you know you could you could not make you up your mind if the work which was presented was a fragment or was a work. And uh, for me, that's a very important that I cannot consider the fragment as a not a work. The fragment is part of a work or even the total of a work. So, uh, you know, that's my point of view, and I respect it. Thank you. <laughs> I, th I think that by way of conclusion, I wanted to synthesize a, a phrase from uh, Martin Scherzinger's elegant essay. Um, speaking of Boulez's embrace of the technical promise of the electroacoustic machine, is elegantly expanded into a philosophical trope in Mille Plateau, now figured as an abstract machine. As it is with Boulez's synthesizing machine, the abstract machine opens philosophical thought to concrete new forms. It deterritorializes strata to generate a plane of consistency or a body without organs. And somehow I think this fits with something that you wrote, uh, Maestro Boulez, in, in your acceptance speech for the 2009 Kyoto Prize. This is a phrase that stuck with me for quite a long time after our wonderful graduate student, Yoshiaki Onishi, uh, provided it for us. If I dare to use only one word to sum up what I consider essential in this relationship between the direct and the technology, it would be transgression. To transgress is to extend the limits of our instrumental technology, the construction of the instrument and its use. To transgress is to go toward a new world, if not entirely new, at least uncommon. This is the exception that has become the rule. Um, thank you very much for speaking with us today. <laughs>